Hello, I hope you're doing well. This is David. We're back with another episode of The Innovative Leader. Uh, Christy is on with me as well. And today we're going to talk about VUCA. Uh, <laughs> uh, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Can't even say that right today, Christy. Um, so this ought to be fun. Um, so uh, let's just a quick um, background to what uh, VUCA is. Uh, and we're, we're going to appeal to Wikipedia for this. But um, so it's an acronym. Uh, it was first used in 87 uh, and introduced by the War College, the U.S. Army War College. Um, and it describes um, the more volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous, ambigu ambi ambiguous. Ambiguous, yep. <laughs> that, uh, that kind of began to flow out of the end of the Cold War. And um, uh, so it, it actually drew on some business and leadership theories from, from Warren Bennis and Bert Nannis. Um, and so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that today. We're going to talk about the volatility, the uncertainty, the complexity, the ambiguity. And then we're, and, and we're going to talk about it in, in, uh, in the context of uh, a comfort level with that and, and then curiosity, clarity, and then collaboration. And so, uh, Christy, I hope you're well. Um, let's talk uh, uh, VUCA. Is that how you pronounce uh, the acronym? Yeah, I think VUCA, the VUCA world. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so let's talk about just VUCA in a in a in a broader sense, real quick, uh, for those who may not uh, know much about it or have uh, an understanding of that. Uh, describe a little bit about what VUCA is, and and, um, and then we'll begin to talk about some of these other aspects. Sure. So again, like you were saying, it started out of the Army War College, which I don't know a whole lot about, but any human being can really stop and just marinate on that, because what is more VUCA than war? And so when you think about those four things of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, those are four things that make decision making hard. It yeah. makes uh, leadership more challenging and it makes navigating and making strategic plans more challenging. And so I think that this is really part of strategic leadership and that when you're in a situation where you have this VUCA kind of a setting, which again, when you think about the conditions of war, there's volatility where um, the dynamics are constantly changing and there are, um, you know, you think about volatility, vulnerability, like people are more vulnerable than usual, that you could, um, there's something that could happen, your safety and your security is somewhat at risk or yeah. constantly on the edge. Um, uncertainty, where you just don't know, when are they attacking? Where are we going? Where will we be tomorrow? It's not like you can sit and be like, well, I'll call you next Thursday at nine o'clock. You don't know. You don't know what's gonna be happening next Thursday at nine o'clock. So the, the situation of uncertainty, complexity, where there's many variables, it's not a simple A plus B equals C. There's many variables, some that you know, some that you don't know, some that you might have an intuition about, um, some that you might have a sense of, but you don't have proof of. So there's great complexity as you try to navigate that. And then ambiguity is just um, things that, to me, ambiguity, I will frequently call in coaching is squishiness, where things are squishy. We want them to be concrete. We want them to be defined and solid, and they're just not. And so when things are squishy, as a leader, sometimes we can have a temptation to wait till we have all the facts before we make a decision. Sometimes we have a temptation to want to do more research and get more data before we make a decision or make a plan. And the reality is right now, and as you said, VUCA leadership, really the concept started in 1987. So it's been around a long time. And it's interesting because back in the 2000s, it started 
coming up more again and in coaching in the coaching world. I know the VUCA world has been talked about for several years now, but really when you think about COVID, COVID is such a great example of a VUCA world where there's volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. That recipe is more present today for everybody. Sometimes we're able to live in our own little bubble and isolate ourselves from some of these variables, but really with COVID, most people, especially leaders, are needing to acknowledge and deal with these four attributes, which is why it kind of leads us to what are four skills that leaders can have to help them navigate a VUCA season, a VUCA world, a VUCA time? How can you navigate that? Because it, do we have to be a victim of it? And we just have to endure it? Do we just have to survive it? Is this just a crazy wave that we need to ride? Uh, no. In leadership, we would say, lead forward. You want to strategically lead in VUCA times even more intentionally because of these attributes and these characteristics going on. No, I, yeah, absolutely. And I, you, again, like you said, COVID brings this really to bear because, you know, there's a lot that we don't know. Uh, there's a lot that we don't know in, in kids going to school, in when jobs are going to come back, and so many of these things. So, so there is a, a whole lot there that we need to, to deal with. And, and like you said, there's, so, there's, so we're going to talk about that in the context of some skills that would help us and allow us to, um, to kind of navigate these waters. And, um, you know, the first one is we've got to be comfortable with being uncomfortable, uh, really. Isn't that the hard, I mean, that's the hardest thing because our brains are wired for certainty. Uh, so we need to be comfortable with uncertainty. Um, and that is one of the hardest things that, that, that people can do or people can, but, but there's so much emotion uh, wrapped up in, in uncertainty. And, and uh, you know, people, so, so many people are control freaks. They like to control how things happen and you just can't in a VUCA kind of environment. Um, so we got to be comfortable with that. Um, you know, we've talked about that uh, a little once before, um, but uh, let's talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, so uncertainty is interesting because it's part of that whole scarf model of what our brain craves and that when we have uncertainty, it's one of those scarf triggers that takes us into our limbic mode versus our frontal lobe where we're able to lead with greater clarity, big picture, all of that was back in those scarf episodes that we did. So definitely uncertainty. I laugh with the whole comfort with being uncomfortable because I am a very uh, type A control freak. I like, you know, order and I like to have a plan. And then I have a plan if that plan doesn't work and I'll have a slight draft of the plan C <laughs> if plan A and B don't work, right? So being comfortable with uncomfortable um, situations is hard for lots of us. And I think a lot of times too, as we move in leadership, you learn strategies in order to be efficient and in order to automate things and in order to be able to communicate and reach more people and streamlining things. These used to be things that we prided ourselves on. And so you've got all these things nicely stacked up and then something comes along that blows those out of the water and it, it kind of challenges the way that we operate because we can't quite move as fast or something that we thought we, we thought we had a tower built and it got knocked down. And that brings me to the emotion that I think one of the greatest challenges as leaders and maybe, you know, with our leaders, what are the emotions that you feel when you have this uncomfortability with the VUCA world? Does it make you feel discouraged? Do you feel demotivated? Do you feel depressed? Do you feel like giving up? Do you, maybe you're really motivated and uh, charged up by it. But for me, as a control person, I feel frustrated. And so frustration, though, is really a skill that, that I have to develop, that leaders have to develop to not be frustrated. Because if you're comfortable, you're not going to get frustrated. You're able to be agile. You're able to be more nimble and dynamic 
So you don't actually get hijacked, but you're able to stay in that frontal lobe and go with it because you're comfortable with being uncomfortable. You're comfortable with things changing. You're comfortable with the fact that there is volatility, uncertainty, ambiguity. And that is a skill that really needs to be developed if you don't have it or if you've gotten really comfortable in the 2.0 world of fast and black and white, things are black and white and we can go really fast. Well, this is a very gray world. And in the gray world, the lines are not clear. And if you get frustrated because the lines aren't clear and because you keep trying to create structure where structure keeps getting knocked down, you'll be frustrated, but you won't be able to navigate this very well. Right. No. How, I, how does it affect you? So, uh, you know, um, so I'm not, I'm not so type A. Right. <laughs> we get to enjoy that. <laughs> I don't have to control everything. Um, and I don't know. I, I remember, I, I don't know when it happened. I don't know. I, maybe I've just always been that way, but I've kind of been able to be flexible and kind of go with the flow. So, so volatility and uncertainty, um, those kinds of things um, usually don't bother me. Um, I, I just adapt and move on um, in, in my, in my work. That's what I do. You know, I get things that are thrown at me, um, odd, odd things that are thrown at me. You just take it and, and, and run with it. Um, I don't know. I think, I, I think I kind of learned that from my dad. I mean, maybe that's my dad's personality. Um, but I, I see that so much. Now my wife is a lot like you. She's very, type A and, and uh, her family kind of calls her, calls her the cruise director of the family because she plans everything and she, you know, those kinds of things. And she's very, she's very, um, controlling is a bad term. It's a negative, has a negative term, but she's right. interested to know what everything that's going on. And, um, and I'm, it, which makes our relationship work, I think on some levels, because I'm laid back, I'm the stable one because I can handle that. Um, but I've, you know, um, I, I think there, um, there is there is something to, to genetics and something to, to how you were raised and, and the family and all that and how that that affects you. Um, uh, but yeah, I just I just kind of go with it. Um, I just kind of take it now. When it does get me is when when I am already when I have no margin. Um, and then something really does throw you off. Um, I don't get depressed, but I do need to walk away for a, a little while and kind of recompose because, you know, you hit that limit where you have no margin and, you know, uh, all of a sudden everything changes and, and you've got to kind of step away from that, uh, you know, to kind of regain your composure and get back in, in up here instead of acting uh, or reacting maybe. But yeah, it, it just... I just kind of go with the flow, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting point too, right? There may be a little bit of the seduction to be more reactive, um, yeah. which has its pros and cons too, because comfort with being uncomfortable isn't reactive mode. It right. is kind of more of a, mm, I don't know if we'd say a controlled chaos, but it's just, it's responding rather than reacting. Right. And responding is a different place. Like you said, when you get in the reacting, you got to step away, regain composure, so you can come back in and respond versus react. Right. And yeah, and, and I, I think that's probably a good uh, way to deal with it. You know, um, I, Nick Saban, so I'm an Alabama football fan, and people either love Nick Saban or they hate Nick Saban. But one of the things he does, and he actually plans for chaos. Uh, on the football field. So he, he works to help his team understand that when something bad happens, that you've got the mental toughness, the, the grit to kind of take it and, and adapt. And his mantra is on the football field, one play at a time. Don't worry about the next play. Don't worry about the play that happened just before. Do your best on this one play. And um, I think that if we can, if we can micro focus on what we're that one play, that one step that needs to happen, and and mentally 
you know, he, one of the things he says is when your body gets tired, your mental focus goes away. Your grit will, will lessen because your body is, is, is breaking down. So you've got to almost push your body past some of those, uh, those limits so that your, your, your mind can be clear in the, in the midst of stress and um, an unfortunate chaos. Um, and so if we can, if we can just focus on that one thing that we're doing and be mentally tough to the point that when something bad comes along, it doesn't break us, that's responding. And I think that's how the military train, um, I think, uh, because they, they live in complete VUCA. When they're in the midst of a battle, everything, that, that's all it is, Right. So it's, 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 a, it's a holistic view of training your body, your mind, uh, and then just training your awareness. Maybe that goes back to mindfulness where you're in the moment and you're seeing everything and you're aware. Uh, and um, when, when that happens, then I think you can adapt and, and, and respond uh, appropriately. I think if, you're, if you live your life with no margin, if you, if you live your life with um, – uh, where you have to control everything. I think, again, I think that's where we're going to, we're going to have problems, but we have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And your ability to keep your mind calm in order right. to navigate that when things are uncomfortable without reacting or getting frustrated as part right. of the skill. Yeah. You know, um, there was a, a movie, um, Few years ago with Kevin Costner where he was a Coast Guard uh, jumper from the helicopter. I, I don't mm -hmm. know the movie. But one of the things they practice, and I think the Air Force does this too, is they essentially weight down cadets, throw them in a pool and tell them to get out. And what they talk about is it, the cadets that can can be calm and keep their mind and keep their wits to them in the midst of that are the ones who excel. Um, and when you get put in react in situations where your things are stressful and where you, you have to adapt, um, then, then how you react, how your mind reacts, how your body reacts, um, it's going to play a big part in how, how your, your ability to kind of push through that. And, and maybe in some ways it's, for me, it's been put I've been put in situations where I've been uncomfortable. And so being uncomfortable is just kind of norm for, for me. Um, and, uh, and, and if, if that's kind of part of your, your life, how you were raised or, or maybe even your position, then you can adapt and get used to being uncomfortable. I, I don't know. I'm trying to, I just think that, that some of that is experience and some of that is, um, you know, again, having that holistic understanding of, of your body, your mind, uh, and being able to kind of push through that when your body's struggling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's some, I think some people more naturally have it in their disposition. Um, and I think for those of us who don't, there are things that you can do to help with your cortisol, or even uh, look into cold showers, things like that. There's things that you can do that help to build that. But yeah, some people have it more naturally and some people don't. So the second skill, are you ready to move to that one? Yeah, let's move. Okay, so the second skill and ways to help lead, skills that we as leaders need in order to lead in the VUCA world is really curiosity. And this is the art of asking questions. Wow. And this also dovetails with that 4.0 leadership model as well. So in 2.0 leadership, we, prided ourselves on knowing the answer, being the smartest person in the room, uh, whatever it was, right? You worked your way up the ladder. Now you're the expert, uh, whatever, right? Versus in the 4.0 world, 4.0 leadership, and really dovetailing on the VUCA skills is curiosity. So what is this situation about? What is different? What is changing? How does this impact things? What is the opportunity here? What is the gift? Um, what did we used to do that's no longer effective? What are we holding on to that we need to let go of? There are tons of skills or questions 
as a leader that we want to be asking ourselves those questions so that we are not attached to an old framework that essentially is going to sink us to the bottom because we are attached to old things versus really curiously asking the questions so we're assessing the situation because we know things are constantly changing. What are your thoughts or how do you see curiosity being important for a VUCA world? Yeah, so um, so you can react when things get ambiguous and, and you feel vulnerable, or you can, like you said, you can ask questions. Okay, so what does that mean uh, is one. What, what can I do with that? If something you know shows up, what can I do with that? Um, how can I use that? that tool that just showed up. Um, I play, oddly enough, I played a lot of role player games when I was growing up. Of course, this was in the eighties. And so it was, we're not talking about this stuff now, but um, you know, you run up across certain things in those games and, and that's what you have to do. What can I do with this? Or you run up against a problem and you go, what do I have in my backpack that I can use to deal with this? And um and so you get curious about the things in, the, uh, um, in your environment. You ask those questions, you go talk to people. Hey, this happened, what does that mean? How can I then take what I have learned from that and adapt, put it in my skill set so that when, when something similar comes along, now I've got a tool that I can use to deal with it. And um, so I think of asking a lot of questions, being very teachable, uh, having a learning mindset, uh, will take you very far in a, in a VUCA environment. Um, I, I just think that that, that that just needs to be part of our, our nature and our DNA. And for some people, that's a learning, something that has to be learned. Mm-hmm. It has to be learned. Yeah, I was on a webinar yesterday about leaders learning coaching skills and that a lot of times leaders tend to be more mentors or teachers rather than coaching because the difference really in a coaching skill is asking questions so that people arrive at their own conclusions they create their own solutions and really the art of asking questions comes from a a mindset or a heart of curiosity so i think it is interesting for leaders to develop this skill set of being curious and wondering. If we're missing the wonderment, it's hard to be curious. You kind of come up with fake questions. What do you think about that? What do you want to do? They're almost like loaded questions or backseat questions where it's your backseat driving almost as if you have the answer, but you're waiting for them to guess it. Those are really irritating questions generally for uh, our followership for team members to get from a leader because they're like, oh, great. What is, what do they want me to say? What are they trying to go for? Right. But true curiosity. And I think it's interesting tipping a little bit to the next one. The next one is really that leaders have to have the skill of clarity on where they're headed. And I think that partners a bit with curiosity because in order for you have the clarity of what is the vision what is the new opportunity? What are the goals and what are we trying to achieve? As a leader, in order for you to share that clarity, I believe it's important for you to have asked yourself those questions before to go, what is volatile? What are the dynamics that are changing? What are the speeds that are, are adapting here that are different? What is the catalyst that's happening? Um, Or even if we look at uncertainty, what do we know and what do we not know? What could surprise us? What's predictable? Or if we look at complexity, what's complex? Uh, What is clear? What's black and white? What's gray? What are the cause and effects? What are the um, red herrings that we're making a deduction that is not necessarily an accurate deduction? Uh, Or ambiguity, like what is unclear? What is the fog? What is causing people to not be able to see clearly? And as we ask ourselves those questions in curiosity around simply exploring VUCA, it helps us to have greater clarity in order to cast that vision and to say, okay, team, we're in the middle of COVID and there are these ambiguities, there are these complexities, there are these uncertainties and this volatility that's happening. And that can be emotionally exhausting to deal with. And here's what we know. This is where we're headed. Our company, 
our team, our organization is committed to X, Y, Z. And the way that we do that is X, Y, Z. And between here and there, we're working together to achieve that. And so there's this way that if we are curious as leaders, we are able to better cast a relevant vision than if we just cast our vision, but missed asking those questions because we made assumptions or we are just on the same path that we've been for the last five years, 10 years, whatever. Yeah, you know, uh, so there's two thoughts out of that. Um, the first is um, a lot of times we, I think we live in fear mm. and, and fear is um, a, a, a debilitating aspect, right? Um, uh, so much, we would rather be ignorant. I mean, ignorant is bliss for a lot of people. Um, and so when, when we have that mentality, um, we lack curiosity. And I think a lot of times that kind of flows out of fear. I don't want to know because I might, mm-hmm. but I find out. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, that, whether that's about yourself or whether about, that's about another situation or whether that's about looking at the impact of COVID fiscally or physically or, or whatever. You know, we would rather just be ignorant uh, because that helps us sleep at night. Yep. Um, and so I think that that is, uh, that's a huge aspect. We have to kind of push through that fear mm-hmm. and, and live in a level of, of curiosity. And um, the other thought that I had has slipped my mind and I should have t- written it down or, or, or uh, typed it up or did something while, while you were talking. Um, but maybe it will come back to me, um, come back to me in a moment. But uh, I just think from a, a curiosity standpoint, I, I think so many people live in fear. I, I, I mean, I do. Um, I, oh, uh, here's the other thought. So there is this phrase, it's called semiotics. Uh, and it's, a, it's, it's born out of a philosophical world. Um, and it essentially means the study of signs. Hmm. So um, my, my doctoral professor uh, called himself a semiotician. And um, so semiotics essentially is looking out at the world and seeing what's going on and kind of feigning it and understanding what's going on by what, under, just being, being aware of what's going on and then looking for patterns within it. Mm. And so, so, so much of what we do is just disorganized. In other words, we're just, we're just trying to make it. Right. And in, and in many cases, that's that's what we do as leaders. We're just we're just we're just taking one day at a time and and we're not looking over here. and We're not looking over there. We're just we're just trying to make it one day at a time, especially if you're a small business or struggling small business in, in a VUCA environment. That's that's very true. Yeah. But until until we're able to. To take the time to look and see what's going on within the world and maybe even futuring it so you can so you can look and see and then and then out of that you can see a, a direction to go uh, that awareness uh, of what's happening in the environment in which you're uh, that that's actually a form of clarity if you can find that clarity in that chaos um, by by looking around and seeing that then I think that um, I think that ties actually curiosity and, and clarity together. I wonder you see something happening, you wonder, I wonder what that's all about. Uh, mm-hmm. Clarity to your vision, clarity to your, your organization, uh, and you walk through that. Um, but too often we're just trying to make it one day at a time, right? Uh, we're struggling, and so I think we have to be. I think you almost have to put that on the calendar. Uh, just to take a gander of what's happening in the world two or three days a week and maybe try to put together uh, um, a framework for, for navigating that. And that, might, that gives us clarity and vision, clarity and, 
in opportunities, clarity in, in our goals. And so I know we've already transitioned in some level to, to point number three, which is clarity. But I, I think that, I th- but I do think that flows out of curiosity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think that's interesting. I think that's why leaders are learners and that good leaders are constantly learning. You're a student of the world. You're a student of your team. You're a student of your um, ecosystem. You're a student of that niche industry that you participate in. So you're constantly being a student, which as a student, you have this spirit to learn and you have that curiosity and this wonderment that you're not walking in, I know it all, I'm the CEO, I'm the CXO, I am going to tell you. So even though sometimes we get confused because as a leader, your job is to cast the vision, but you're not casting it from this egotistical, arrogant, God seat position that you know it all. So yeah, it's really, I like that. That's that spirit of wonder and how you're every day. And I do think it's important to me. Leaders have that in their daily habits is that somewhere in your day, you are learning whether you're listening to a podcast, a book, whether you're listening to YouTube videos, a Ted talks, whatever it is. And often uh, there was another leader who I remember where it was, but they talked about how really great leaders are not experts in one industry either. They usually have their fingers in multiple industries. And that's Mm -hmm. another way that you kind of spot the patterns because when it's just in your industry, you don't really see it. But if you are active in several kind of lines at the same time, you'll see the patterns showing up. So there's no reason you know, for me, I work in personal growth and development, but I'm very active in ministry things. And I see different patterns in my clients, different various businesses. So it's interesting because you can kind of see, oh, this is a theme going on in the world. This isn't just an industry theme. This is something that's happening. So now let me get curious and learn about that. That that is a great call out. Yeah. You know, um, know, two things out of that. Um, So one of the I think I have a lot of respect for the for, for my doctoral mentor. Um, and the first day of class, this is a guy who's been all over the world. He's taught at several different universities. Um, and he walks in to a bunch of doctoral students. And, and one of the first things he says to, to us is, I am not your professor. I am your colleague. Uh, and so uh, you have a PhD He's done all of his written 60 books, maybe say, I am not your professor. I'm your colleague. That shows a, a level uh, a mindset where he is willing to learn uh, from, from our experiences and our backgrounds in our lives. The second thing is, uh, so one of the, the, actually the father of uh, organizational culture, Ed, uh, Ed Schein, uh, gave a talk uh, at Google a few years ago and saw in, uh, it's on YouTube. I'm actually having my students at, uh, at Tabor College actually watch that uh, and, and kind of discuss it. One of the things, the title of it, and it, uh, there's a book that flowed out of it, is called Humble Leadership. Hmm. The fact that, that as leaders, we have to recognize um, relationships are, are hugely important. But, but number two, that, um, that we don't know everything. And if we can... If we can, and, and I think even Jim Collins in Good to Great talks about uh, this. It's been, God, that's been 20 years ago. Uh, but but the, the, the best leaders tend to be the humble leaders uh, who's, who are willing to learn. I mean, you see a lot of, um, you see a lot of the impact of Apple um, after Steve Jobs got fired. Uh, when he went to Pixar and then he came back his mindset was different. Now, being fired was part of it, but I also think being part of that startup at Pixar was hugely um, important and, and impactful. And, and from there, they, they took off and they haven't stopped. Um, I see um, the leader uh, of Microsoft, and I, can, I cannot pronounce his name, um, Sadia something. But um, so you had Balmer, who was you know, one of the founders, uh, he transitions out, you have this 
this he's of Indian descent. You see him come in. He has a whole different framework, whole different mindset. Microsoft takes off. Uh, so I think this this humility about having this humility. Elon Musk, for instance, you know, all the things he has his hand in because he struggle. He he strives to learn and to adapt uh, in that. And so I, I think you're right. I think the the best leaders, the most innovative leaders are the leaders who can learn and who don't think they know everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I thought you froze for a second. I was just waiting. Sorry about that, Miami. <laughs> what happened? I said I thought that it looks like my internet kind of slowed down. Yeah, and you didn't froze for a sec. Yeah, and I think that whole concept about not knowing everything, it's not just because you don't know everything or not just because you're being humble, although I agree those are key points, but I think that's how it plays into the VUCA world. When there's volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, things are changing. I'm sorry, you are not God. So there is no way for you to know that. And I think that kind of tips into... Our, our next points, like there's the clarity, but if we, and we can come back to clarity, but then that next point after clarity is collaboration. And the reason why collaboration is so important is because there's more than one smart person in the room and there is multiple skills in the room for multiple reasons. And so when you're coming with that humility and as a leader, you've got the vision and you're, you're encouraging the team with faith and hope and optimism to know that what they're doing makes a difference, that they're bought into the mission, that they feel compelled about where they're going and why they're going. That's around the clarity of vision. But then moving to this fourth piece around collaboration is not your job to say how things are done. It's not your job to impart your divine wisdom on the team, but really to to call that forth and then to empower the team so that those solutions are coming from the bottom up. What are ways that they see to solve things? And I think that's where millennials really get upset or really get excited is they've got a different view on the world than where we've been in different generations because they had a different lens that they grew up with. So the solutions that they see or that come first to mind are often very different than Gen X, Gen Y, or baby boomers, whoever else is in there. So this diversity is really important because it allows us to solve VUCA challenges in a better way because we're collaborating versus if we do, if we try to solve VUCA challenges with one leader, that's why it doesn't work because one approach isn't actually sage enough to navigate the, the whole recipe that is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. So when you've got 10 people standing around the elephant, you're better able to identify and navigate what you're dealing with and different approaches to solve that versus when you just have one person at the front you've got one plan. And when you are collaborating, it allows you to have so much more diversity and breadth of understanding and options to respond because you've been open to collaboration versus this linear one-way direction. Yeah. I mean, collaboration obviously is huge, especially in the leadership 4.0 environment. Um, and, and and, and really, you, you kind of said it all, I think, that, that I, I don't know everything. Um, and you don't know everything, but we, we bring all these skill sets together and all these experiences together. And so when we can work uh, together and collaborate, we actually draw on the experience of the community as opposed to one person's experience. And when you do that, you're right. You're able to navigate that the ambiguity um, and you're able to, to navigate that um, that framework. Uh, I, I, oddly enough, I, I'm thinking of um, the movie Jumanji. Mm. Uh, that that popped into my head because we it's, we've watched it a couple of times in the last three or four weeks. Um, we love that movie. Not the not the Robin Williams version. The, okay. The the Dwayne Johnson version. And you see all these people. You see these four people, five people really, with diverse skills. 
and they they have to work together to get out of the game. And it, it's a life or death scenario for them. And and in war, it's a life or death scenario uh, for them. And so there is a lot of collaboration like that. Like that, we don't necessarily see businesses life or death or organizations life and death. But we need to act in some cases like it is in, in, in that, especially in, in, in a group environment where we can, we can collaborate because, because we don't know what it is. It's just the reality. And in our, we may have someone who's got a, a level of experience uh, in an area that, that allows us to escape um, uh, a bad situation simply because they have been through it. Uh, and so I think, uh, actually, I think Jumanji kind of brings it. Uh, if you haven't seen that movie, you might want to check it out. It's incredibly funny, and, and, but it gives us a really good example of that. Yeah, that's fun. I think it's great to see a life or whatever. It's not a real life, but an example like that, because I, I think sometimes, and it reminds me a little bit, I feel like sometimes we get exhausted with team building, right? That was kind of a term uh, in the 90s, 2000, team building, let's do more team building. And it was the eye roll for followership and leaders was like, oh, okay, let's check the box. Let's do team building. <laughs> but it's not really that kind of team no, building. Wait, what? The ropes courses where everybody, yeah, all rope courses and trust and, and all that kind of stuff. And yeah. Yeah. And it's not that they're bad, but when you're talking about the movie, it reminded me of that. But to me, it, it is a, it is that in a whole nother level. So yes, you need to teamwork, but it's not teamwork to check the boxes. It's not teamwork to pretend, you know, kumbaya, oh great, we have this great culture. I think in the in the 2.0 culture, that's what we thought it was about, was trying to create, it. maybe that was more in the 3.0 era where we were transitioning over to four, where we were trying to be relational, we were trying to see the human being, but we didn't quite get it. But now as you look at the 4.0 world and where we're at, those relationships are not, it's not just, oh, go ahead, you go first. Oh yeah, you swing across first and then I'll go. It's not politeness. It is, like you were saying in the Jumanji movie, it is critical in order to elevate the strengths of the team members so that you can get out, so that you can solve the puzzle. Uh, I think you're frozen again. Are you there? All right, I'm just pausing for a minute. David. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, good. I'm here. Okay. Are you unfrozen? Yeah, I'm unfrozen. I'm sorry. My computer going a little crazy today. I apologize. No, you're great. All right. Well, we got to wrap up anyway. So um, let's see. So we've got comfort, curiosity, clarity, collaboration, uh, maybe wrapping up. Any closing thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, say that again. I, I, I missed that part. Oh, yeah. Sorry. You're still frozen on my screen, but I don't know how to refresh it. Oh, well, it, it, Hopefully the internet will catch up in a minute. Yeah. Um, so go ahead and say that again and then we'll, we'll wrap sure. it up. I was just saying, yeah, and wrapping up, like we've got those four skills, really the four skills for leaders. Like we are in a VUCA world. We've been in a VUCA world, but the opportunity to learn how to navigate it is even greater. Um, it's a skill set that you can't be selective of and go, oh, I don't need to learn that one. Leaders right. need to learn these skills. So number one is the comfort, being comfortable with being, getting comfortable with being uncomfortable so that you can navigate, you can respond and keep your cool. Number two is curiosity, asking questions, having that spirit of wonderment, constantly learning. And number three is clarity, casting that vision, where are we headed and why, what is the opportunity and instilling that faith for people to follow that vision and know where they're going because there's so much things we don't know. So that clarity becomes critical. And then right. collaboration is how are we going to do that? How will we get there is really leveraging all the strengths on the team. 
Um, so kind of in closing, anything else that, David, you think of in those four skills or the VUCA world that just um, would support leaders as they, they work to grow in that skill set? Yeah, I, I just, um, I'm going to, I'm trying to think of anything else that I could add on that. Um, and I think you just kind of really covered it all. So um, I'm going to, I'm going to just let that be the end of it. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. And for leaders, if you haven't studied VUCA, it's an interesting thing to go watch a couple uh, videos on. VUCA yeah. talks a lot about strategic leadership. And again, it's not a new concept, but it definitely captures what's happening today. So if you feel a little bit overwhelmed, frustrated, uh, exhausted, uh, just stop and take a step back and be like, okay, wait a minute, this is just a VUCA opportunity for me to lead through. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I wish I, I, I honestly haven't read a lot on VUCA. I, I know the concept and have looked at it uh, on several different occasions, but, but uh, there is a lot out there and uh, spend some time uh, checking that out um, and, then, and then doing some additional learning. So, all right, I know we have to run. Uh, it's good to be with you again and uh, we look forward to next time. All right. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, for our leaders, if you have comments on VUCA, ways that you're dealing with it, ways that you've learned those skills, put it in the comments. We'd love to hear from you and respond to that and subscribe whatever channel you're following. If you're on YouTube or on a podcast channel, make sure to hit subscribe. And if you feel like this would be useful, share it with a friend. We'd love for you to do that. All right. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye.